<sighs> I'm always waiting for my mother to jump in on that song and join in, but <laughs> I guess she is somewhere. Uh, now, I'm going to go here for the conveniences of YouTube so that I know when I'm crapping the YouTube video that I'm going to start here so that I don't get uh, dinged for any copyright and music. We just listened to It Is Well With My Soul by Cutlass. Great version of the song. Uh, we played it in honor of my brother-in-law, Tom Furlow, who passed away yesterday. For his family, he was a Marine, Native Roman, Dominic Furlow, my nephew. Tom, you will be missed. Let's see, how are we on the Zoom? Oh, there we go. That. Alright. This time I'm going to remind people to open their Bibles to certain chapters. Uh, <laughs> if you're unable to see the screen. Alright. <laughs> oh, right there. So we're going to be continuing in Psalm 119. We are at the part of the acrostic poem called Beleth. Learning a little Hebrew here. Hannah Lily. Oh. Um, that's literally. I put in my mouth. <laughs> I want to read it with my food in my mouth. Oh. Hannah has food in her mouth. Give me a second. Yeah, we're giving Hannah a second. My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to his word. Hannah, but you're not Hannah. There, you better? I have to go to school all over again. My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. All right. Thank you, Jerry. When and I told of my ways, you'll always answer me. Answer me. Teach me your statues. Statues. Paul. Make me understand the way of your precepts. Precepts, and I will. Meditate on your wondrous works. Very good. Well, wait, did Paul do well? Uh, yes, Paul did very good. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. Okay. What? Just, just read. Hurry up. You don't tell me to hurry up. No, no, read. Richard, oh, go. Go. I have chosen the ways of the faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling your to your testimonies, O oh Lord, it, and let me not be put to shame. Very good, Richard. Other than the word is testimonies, not testinomies. <laughs> But that's okay. It's like if you say cinnamon, but said it synonym. Yeah. It's okay. Testimonies. Yes. I would even be able to say that. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Yes. Psalm 119, 25 through 32. And I forgot to do this. Oh. Ah. Well, 
turn in, we're going to turn in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 6, 1 through 5. I did zoom in. That's as far as I can zoom in. Oh. Yeah. Remember that whole thing I wanted to do where I went from the screen? That's why. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. All right. Daniel 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three presidents, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the presidents and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. No, no, Jacob was doing that. Doing what? Okay. All right. So, much like any other character that we've come in contact with in the Bible, many historical critics will tell you that this king, Darius, well, I say Darius, they say Darius, tomato, tomato, whatever, doesn't matter. This king, Darius the Mede, they'll tell you that he didn't exist. So my impression of biblical critics is they run around looking for anything they can nitpick in the Bible, and if it's not written expressly down, they will tell you that this person didn't exist. They tried to tell us that Jonah didn't exist. They tried to tell us that because they used a couple of words that were different, that the whole story of Jonah is nonsense. It is true. And the story of Jonah much like the story of Daniel, is true. You cannot think of it as fairy tales, as stories that teach you good things. You have to think of them, these things as historical truth. King Darius the Mede did exist. Critics will point out to you that it was Cyrus the Great of Persia that was in command of the army when they came into Babylon and took over, it was not Darius the Mede. Darius, Darius, like I said, whatever. Now, Cyrus the Great, it is attested to that he was the king of kings of the Persian Empire. But who is this Darius the Mede? There are two historical records that we can follow when it relates to the establishment of the Persian Empire. There's Xenophon, who was a Greek uh, his, no, historian. He says that the Medes, who were ruled by Cyaxares II, were allied with Persia, who was ruled by mm -hmm. Cyrus the Great. So this Cyaxares II would have taken as was custom, a throne name when he came to become the king. His throne name was most likely Darius the Mede. Just be careful where you put it. Not in the stampede. As is a hazard with anything you do in your house, Sometimes your live services come in with conversations from children talking about how they're not hungry. So, like I was saying, Cyaxares II 
was the ruler of Media. Cyrus the Great was the king over all of it, was the king of Persia. They were a combined kingdom. Now, if you follow Herodotus, who was also a Greek historian, he tells you that Persia, that was ruled by Cyrus the Great, destroyed the Median kingdom and deposed their king, Cyaxares II. Therefore, uh, Herodotus says that Darius the Mede never existed. Xenophon says he does, Herodotus says he doesn't. Well, there are some clues in history that point to Darius the Mede did exist. One of them, evidence that gets conveniently ignored, is Cyrus the Great's mother was a Mede. Marriage in the ancient Near East was done to forge alliances. So the whole reason that Cyrus... The Great, uh, his father, I think it was Cambyses the first, would have gotten married to a Mede, was to combine the two kingdoms. Would Cyrus then turn around and destroy his allies after his mother was one of them? No, I don't think so. Herodotus says yes. All the evidence points to probably not. Also, Nabonidus... Remember in the last chapter, we heard about how Belshazzar couldn't have been the king because he was the prince regent, and Nabonidus was the actual king of Babylon. He chronicled that at the same time, the king of the Medes, who would have been Darius the Mede, Cyaxares II, and the king of the Persians came to attack him, and this was after Herodotus said the Persians conquered the Medes. So the people at the time are saying that this Darius the Mede existed. The rulers of the time say they existed. But Herodotus, who wrote later, says he didn't. I think he did. I think Cyaxares II is King Darius the Mede. The Assyrians were the ones that appointed satraps originally. Think of them as regional governors. How the U.S. has 50 states. The governor of the 50 states, each one would have been a satrap. The Persian Empire had hundreds of them because it was huge. Went all the way to India in the east and all the way into Greece in the west. The Persian Empire was enormous. When the Bible says so that the king might suffer no loss, it's talking about taxes. The king wanted to make sure that his money got to him. Uh, the Bible verse says that the king appointed all these people, all these satraps. He didn't want to lose any tax money, so he had the money delivered to the satraps, and the satraps would deliver the money to him. So when the king didn't suffer any loss, he didn't want to lose his tax money. Like I said, a big empire needs efficient tax collection method. Big empire. Centralized. King of kings was Persia. And all his little regional governors brought the money to him once a year. So these satraps, it says, are jealous of Daniel. And they want to find a way to get him in trouble. But the question is, why? Why would these satraps be jealous of Daniel? They're the heads of these big governorships, and they're collecting the king's tax money, and they're in control. Why are they jealous of Daniel? What does he do? Interpret dreams? The Bible tells us that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. My feet just got really wet. <laughs> because Grace just dropped a glass of water on the floor. The great grace, don't whine. My feet are wet. Okay, continue. Um, so when the Bible says that King Darius planned to set him, Daniel, over the whole kingdom, Daniel was supposed to be 
he wasn't going to be a king, but Daniel was going to be a satrap above the other satraps. So this is why the satraps were jealous, because Daniel was going to be made governor. Was going No, not money. Lots of money. He was going to be made in control over these satraps. Daniel was going to be given power over them. So, the satraps are trying to come up with something. They couldn't find anything that Daniel was doing wrong. Tax evasion. <laughs> they tried all through the laws of uh, Persia. They couldn't find any law that Daniel was breaking. So they said, we need to make something up and get him uh, get him on the law of his God. How he worships. Persians were very tolerant Zoroastrians. Zoroastrianism was made by Zoroaster. Also known as Zarathustra. But anyway... The Zor uh, Zoroastrians are dualists, which meant that they thought there was one supreme good god and one supreme bad god who were in control over things. They believed in heaven and hell. They believed that souls were judged after death. And they believed that souls had free will to live. So Zoroastrianism, very similar to Christianity, similar. Yeah. Is it gone? Don't show it to me unless it's gone. Is it gone? Is it gone? I see food on the plate. Oh, Yeah, eat it. Now if we could turn our Bibles to Daniel 6, uh, 6 through 9. Ah. Yes, Paul. Said you didn't mess up this time? Well, it's been kind of silly so far. My feet are still wet. It's a good thing, though, Paul's eating dinner. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects, and the satraps, the counselors, and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. Here we have a picture of a common symbol of Zoroastrianism. Is that an eagle? Uh, wings of some kind of bird. And they believed that fire was good. And uh, yes. Their god was called Mazda, which I always thought was a car. Yeah. But They spell it the same? Yep, absolutely. Ahura Mazda, maybe? Something like that. But it ends in Mazda. So they worshipped cars long before cars happened. And I don't know, I just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. To this day, you can still find Zoroastrians worshiping uh, Ford and yes. T model. And... There are different. There are different type of Zoroastrianisms. Yeah. So, we shall call this section entrapment. Similar to another episode we encountered. So this is what happens here is similar to something else that we've come across. What? Was the episode that we encountered? The Veggie Tales. That, that's not the episode. I'm, not that episode, Richard. I'm talking about something. Veggie Tales. Yes, there was an episode of Veggie Tales on this. Yes, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm looking for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. They got them on a law that they broke. Remember those guys? They got thrown in the fire. And they worshipped cars. Yeah, it sounds like a car. Hey, listen, Mazdas are not, I don't know, not yep, good. Yep, they worshipped them way before they existed. Before there were yeah, four wheels yeah. and an engine, 
Those well, were Astrianisms, yeah. you know. Yeah, they were worshiping the combustion engine. They, they were they were forward oil. thinkers. Yeah, they were hoarding oil. <sighs> so that last section was very similar to how they lured in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. Now I'll read the next part. Uh, we are in Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. All right. So was Daniel a fair weather <clears throat> believer? The moment the new laws passed, <laughs> what did he do? Did he run? Did he bow down and worship the king? No. 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 He prayed like he always did. Notice that verse 10 says he prayed as he had done previously. So, I've been taught, or it has been suggested before, that Daniel saw mm -hmm. that they passed this new law, and he ran upstairs to his window and says, Ha, 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 I'll show these guys that worship cars. I'll pray right to my God with my window open. And he throws the window open, and he prays as loud as he can so that everybody can see him. But that's not what the Bible verse says. It's not. The Bible tells us that he did this every day, as he had done previously. He wasn't doing it as civil disobedience to try to show off. Daniel was doing it because it was part of his life. <laughs> but no. He did not pray to get seen. He was seen while he prayed. He had a prayer routine. He wasn't going to stop it. He was going to continue on with his life. Daniel has three C's. Courage, conviction, and commitment. You forgot one. Communism. N no. No. Not even close. <laughs> if we were close, I'd, I'd go with it, but not even close. What? Well, it starts with a C. It's a C, not... Yeah, yeah, commitment, so it starts with the same four letters. Oh, my God. Okay. Um, not the time for this. So Daniel had the courage to know that he was right. He had the conviction. Hannah, could we please not stomp on the floor? Paul, what are you doing? Okay. All right. Back here. I'm not done yet. Daniel has three C's. He has the courage... To know that God is on his side. He has the conviction to go through with his life prayer. And he has the commitment to not worry about the law that had been passed that said he couldn't pray to anybody else. What this shows us is that Daniel knew that God's law is greater than any <laughs> law. Oh, dog, please don't walk by the table with the camera. Oh, that's like my nightmare right there. All right. Or too late. So if you were to have a personal trial where they put you on trial saying that you were a believer, would they have enough evidence to convict you? That's a question to ask yourself. No. You live your life in God enough that these satraps would have been able to convict you and throw you in the line. They would not. 
Oh, we'll talk about that. Later. King reaffirms the law before they give up the criminal. Well, that is right before they go and arrest Daniel. The satraps come to him and they're like, King, did you not sign an injunction that says that uh, only people can pray to you for 30 days? And the king says, yes, this was a law. It's steadfast. It's true. We have to believe it. They made him say it. And then they say, well, we've got a criminal for you. But very sneaky. They refer to Daniel as one of those exiles. They didn't even call him Daniel who's in charge of the kingdom. Daniel that's done all this stuff for you. Daniel that answers your dreams. Daniel that's faithful. Daniel that does all this stuff. They call him hey, that dirty foreigner over there. He broke your law. You made this law and he broke it. We're going to turn in our Bibles to chapter 6, 14 through 18. And now it's time for our favorite Mm -hmm. Did you take? Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and sleep fled from him. Alright. King Darius, Darius realizes that they set him up. He realizes it was a trap. And this is very similar to the incident with the fiery furnace. They set up a law. But see, the difference is in the fiery furnace, it was King Humble, Nebuchadnezzar, that set the law and said that everybody had to worship him. And in here, it was the satraps that made the king set this law. Similar, King Nebuchadnezzar, the megalomaniac, demands that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego worship him, whereas Darius feels bad his law has entrapped Daniel. You, you get the sense that King Darius here isn't feeling very good. He's not sleeping. You know, he's nothing is soothing him. He's having he's having trouble. He can't calm down. In verse fifteen, it says they came together by agreement. So all the satraps came together at the same time by agreement. They knew beforehand that this was going to happen. It's a conspiracy. They planned it all out. It was falling in the way that they wanted. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm going to point it out. This is like the second or third time that they said the uh, they've made an emphasis on Persian law cannot be undone. It's happened, they pointed it out several times so far. But why are they pointing it out so much? What are they afraid of? They're afraid that the king is going to try to change his, go back on his word. That better be God calling you. Uh -uh. Uh, Why would God call mom? Well, it's during church. Other than that, it can wait. So, the den was an underground cave split into two rooms. The lions are kept on one side, and the trainer would put food into the other room, leave the door open to encourage the lions to eat anyone or anything the king threw down there. So this is how the lion's den was set up.
Picture a lion's, not a lion's den though. Now back with the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar taunts God and asks who would save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from him. Darius said that God continues to be with Daniel. So here's the here's the difference. Here we also have a parallel to another Bible hero who was sealed in a cave. Who else was put in a cave? Who was sealed in there? Um, Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Yes. Jesus was dead. Daniel was dead. <laughs> but. <laughs> I don't remember where they were from. But yeah. I guess it doesn't matter. I've never seen the boy with Yeah, I have. Yeah, I haven't either. Daniel has shown no fear so far, but Darius does not sleep and he's full of worry. Daniel's sitting down in a room surrounded by a bunch of hungry lions, and Darius is sitting up in his palace. Shouldn't Daniel have the fear? And Darius be fine? No. Well, yes. Richard, that's not the point. Oh. <laughs> this shows us who has faith and who prays. Daniel knows he'll be fine. Daniel knows he'll be fine. Darius is worried because he still worships cars. <laughs> so he doesn't have faith in Daniel's God. We're going to move on to verses 19 through 24. Then it was the day. The king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O oh Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said to the king, O oh king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought in and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Ow. What happened? Did you get hurt and No, the lion ate them. So, Darius shows up at the tomb. Two interesting things that he says. But he leaves one thing out. He says, Daniel, servant of the living God. We all know that our God is alive. Yeah. Even King Darius acknowledges that God is alive. All throughout the Bible... They talk about how idols are dead. They don't hear you. They can't see you. They can't move. Idols are dead. Our God is alive. That's interesting. Uh, Darius also says that the living God is constantly serving Daniel. Constantly. It's happening. It's not stopping. It's constantly. But... So many have taught before, I've heard this many times, that just like Nebuchadnezzar, any time he had a speech at the end of a chapter where he would say good things about Daniel's God, El Elyon, Yahweh, you know, they would say, oh, Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is turning into a Jew. Well, no. 
here he comes. Darius is having this, is your God, he's, he's living, he's constantly serving. But one thing Darius does not say, he doesn't call him my God. He calls him, Daniel is your God. He's not admitting that he follows him. He still worships cars. So, like in the furnace, an angel came down and shuts the lion's mouths. Um, this angel isn't named. The Jewish tradition uh, says it's Michael, but nowhere in that text did it say Michael. The A lot of Christians teach that it was Jesus in his pre- uh, New Testament body form. Daniel calls up and says, an angel was down here. <laughs> so, it's not important in my mind who it was. I think it was an angel. I'm not going to go as far to say that I don't think there's enough textual evidence to say that Jesus was down there shutting lion's mouths, but if you want to believe that, it, it's... There's enough evidence there that it might be, and there's enough evidence there that it might not be. I'm not going to rain on your parade. Daniel was found blameless. Perfect example of his name, Daniel means God is my judge. So when they put Daniel on trial, he was judged to be blameless. Previously, um, I always thought that, you know, King Darius saves Daniel from the den, he, he lives through his judgment, and then he throws in the evil satraps that start the conspiracy, and that's actually not what happens. It says the satraps, their children, and their wives. Mm -hmm. Ow. So, they're all thrown in there. I didn't pick up on this until this time I read through it, Sharing that with you, I always oh, thought yeah. it was—I always thought it was just the officials. Right. You bad guys, throw you in. No, throw the kids and the wives in there too. And when I said "ow" at the end of it, is because they got eaten before they even got to the bottom. Yeah. And they got eaten pretty quick. The lions were probably pretty hungry. So Darius fulfilled the law. You know, through this whole chapter, they kept saying, you, you can't go back on the law. You can't change the Persian law. You can't change the Persian law. You can't change the Persian law. Well, he didn't. <laughs> he, he threw them in there. Like he wrote a law that uh, conspirators can get thrown and that's it? No. They broke the law. They conspired against him? Ah. They got eaten. So... They, uh, they helped themselves out. So the royal decree of King Darius, verse 25, Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, and the reign of Cyrus the Persian, who was Cyrus the Great. Very similar to the decree of Nebuchadnezzar after dealing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and with Daniel. But notice, there's only tolerance granted here. Not a decree that God is the only God. So once again, we get the Daniel's God is a living God. He endures forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. These were all things that the Zoroastrians believed, that there would be, you know, their good God would reign forever and his kingdom would be destroyed and evil people would be judged and there would be a heaven and a hell. Zoroastrians believed in all this. It's just that they believed that it was a Hura Mazda 
and some evil god, and they had dual power over everything. Cars. No. So Darius, just like Nebuchadnezzar, says we have to tolerate Daniel's God. Never does he say he is my God and he is the only God. 